My name is Shahzad Ashraf Chaudhary. I am working as an associate professor in the Department of Computer Engineering, Istanbul Gelsing University, Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, today I am going to present my uh, research paper, uh, Rapid Auth, Fast Authentication for Sustainable uh, Internet of Things, uh, in um, EI International Conference on Forthcoming Networks and Sustainability in the IoT area. My co-authors are Mohammad Naveed Awan and Professor Fadi Al Tarjuman. As you know, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, basically it involves simple, low-cost connected devices with huge and sensitive data generation. The world has seen an exponential growth in the number of IT devices. These devices are envisioned as the enablers for smart cities, smart factories and smart healthcare facilities, among many others. Many IT devices are very simple and low cost and but they generate huge data but they generate huge data and uh, huge and sensitive data these uh, iot devices often they use wireless interface and internet for connectivity with uh, server or data sensor and due to um, this uh, wireless connectivity or internet connectivity they are exposed to a wide range of cyber attacks or threats. Some of the major security, uh, security requirements for the correct operation of IoT based systems include authentication, secure booting, authorization and data integrity and privacy. These are some of the uh, security requirements uh, for IoT operations. So, Traditionally, security protocols slash, slash techniques for the internet were designed with two major assumptions. Number one, any device connected to the internet is physically well protected. Number two, systems connected to the internet have no limitation of powers and memory. So the first assumption, uh, if we take first assumption, it means an adversary uh, may try to launch an attack from remote location by avast dropping, by tampering, injecting packets, blocking something, blocking the messages uh, and all these they can perform all these tasks remotely into the network but cannot physically access this device. And the second one as we discussed systems connected to the internet have no limitation of power, uh, power and uh, memory for internet of thing devices the devices working uh, under iot uh, under the umbrella of iot these iot devices uh, both of these assumptions are wrong for iot devices iot devices are deployed at remote locations so when they are deployed at remote location in some field uh, they don't have any physical protection any adversary can easily gain physical access to the device moreover many iot devices they are having, uh, uh, they are restrained, they are having uh, low cost const and constrained in terms of energy, memory and processing capabilities. So for IoT devices, you must protect those IoT devices physically as well as uh, those devices, the, um, all the tasks performed by those devices should be efficient, should have uh, uh, low computation and communication costs. To address these issues, we propose uh, uh, we propose uh, the use of uh, physical unclonable functions to provide security to IoT devices. Puffs are hardware security uh, primitives, which provides a challenge response mechanism. Uh, puffs exploit the variation in the physical factor uh, using uh, uh, f physical factors during the manufacturing process of integrated circuits. They produce a unique response when excited give with a given challenge through a given chip. That means if chip is changed, the response will be changed. So it will the response will be same on same challenge on a same chip. So chip is changed, it will, uh, it, uh, the, uh, the response will be changed. 
the inherent variability in ic manufacturing make its makes it practically impossible to clone or replicate a puff that means if anyone tries to uh, anyone try to amend or replicate a puff uh, the puff will be useless you cannot do it any attractive choice to establish a root of trust in iot system it can be a very good choice and uh, now it's uh, being used in uh, in variety of applications elliptical cryptography it has emerged uh, as a cryptography technique with computational efficiency uh, with shorter key size for the same level of security as compared to the traditional crypto systems furthermore the tiny ecc further made it an attractive choice for security protocols uh, in the internet in the uh, iot era this paper uses uh, elliptical cryptography plus puffs to speed up the authentication process and to restrict physical attacks that's why the, the title of the paper is rapid auth the contribution of this paper this includes uh, basically we tackle the issue of authentication in iot systems uh, and for, and our uh, contributions are uh, we defined a protocol rapid auth it's a, it is a protocol for sustainable iot which achieves mutual authentication of an iot device and server in the minimal minimum possible number of messages that is the server needs to send and receive only one message to complete the authentication that means they need just one cycle the proposed protocol it uses puffs to eliminate the requirement of any stored secret on the iot device uh, which makes it secure against physical attacks uh, the rapid auth it can support informing a session key without any extra overhead that means uh, just uh, with a single hash function or just with uh, an exclusive or you can form uh, the session key uh, this is the network model uh, in uh, in iot uh, we are we are having uh, uh, the different iot devices they are connected uh, to data center or server through some internet and devices are connected to internet through some border routers so these devices has to establish a secure connection with uh, their data center or server for this purpose uh, this is our network model now uh, some of the assumptions made uh, made in this paper are as follows each iot device has an embedded puff uh, the iot device and the puff is considered a system on chip a tempering attempt to puff will render the puff useless there is a secure channel between a microcontroller and puff within an iot device and all communication between the both mentioned entities is through the secure channel uh, the channel between microcontroller and uh, puff is secure the data center slash server is considered to have unlimited resources and is trusted whereas iot devices have limited energy memory and processing capabilities and they can be definitely they can be um, uh, they can be physically captured and other attacks can be possible on all iot devices the adversary can ever stop uh, a message can inject new false message can replay an old message the adversary can also initiate a session or impersonate or try to impersonate other users or devices even um, the adversary can try to uh, impersonate on behalf of some server or some uh, data center this is our protocol rapid auth uh, this is the block diagram um, the server it is assumed to have a challenge response pair of each device prior to authentication and uh, we have considered maybe may these uh, these uh, crp pair challenge response pair is uh, um, is added manually or electronic electronically for each uh, iot device um, uh, and by the manufacturer moreover uh, the rapid auth uh, it makes use of elliptical cryptography these are the steps uh, in in first step 
the server generates a nouns n1 and an integer a uh, uh, randomly and then computes z1 is ag where g is a base point or over elliptic curve uh, the server then reads the corresponding crp um, ci ri for ida and sends the ecc challenge z1 uh, the puff challenge ci and uh, m1 n1 uh, ri along with the respective mac to the device ida when iot device it receives this message it first uses its puff and the challenge ci to obtain the puff response ri from its own chip or from its own microcontroller it uses ri to obtain n1 and verifies the received mac if the verification fails the authentication request is terminated otherwise it generates uh, 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 two numbers two random numbers b and n2 randomly uh, then calculates z2 is bg and r is eri plus bzi uh, it's the response uh, in uh, is the where e into ri is the response of embedding function to ri now um, uh, the iot device ida it sends uh, this uh, uh, message uh, to server the server on reception of this message uh, computes eris r minus az2 verify the response and verify mac if mac is verified that means the device is authenticated so this was the procedure of authentication uh, in rapid auth uh, this is uh, all this is uh, uh, described over here here d represent any data that uh, an iot device is ida may wish to send to the server so we can also send uh, data to the server session key formation it's very easy to construct a session key based on rapid auth to construct a session key both the devices ida and server can use the secret nonces n1 and n2 for example they may use hn1 exclusive or with hn2 as a secret key for the current session note if an adversary somehow succeeds in obtaining the secret key the system may remain uncompromised as adversary remains unable to compute ri as well as the the valid data we have done the formal verification uh, of our protocol using um, the sidu uh, method uh, basically this method is uh, the formal web protocol verification the purpose of uh, uh, this formal protocol verification is to check the completeness that whether the protocols accept all valid inputs it should be uh, deadlock freeness the protocol does not stay indefinitely and there is there are no deadlocks uh, live lock or tempo blocking freeness the protocol is free of infinite loops termination initiating <clears throat> with the start date start state the protocol transition on valid inputs and always ends up in a well defined final states free of non executable interactions the protocol is free of any interaction except the transmission and reception precisely the interaction paths are followed under normal conditions uh, we have used um, mao and boit logic um, uh, to uh, to to verify uh, the robustness of protocol our protocol rapid auth uh, figure 5 it gives uh, the proof where um, s believes a sent n to using ri as the encryption key so cloning and physical attacks rapid auth uses puffs to safeguard against cloning attack it is a hard problem to clone a unique value of a puff uh, remote development of uh, iot devices can lead to physical capture attack by exposing the secret stored in an iot device however rapid auth does not store any secret any secret in the iot devices we use just puff moreover as the puff and the devices microcontroller are, are assumed to be a soc therefore an adversary cannot listen to the communication between puff and the chip because puff and the chip because 
they they interact on a secure channel this shows that physical attacks are rendered useless in rapid earth uh, performance comparison we have used these three matrices computational complexity communication overhead and verification delay uh, for performance analysis uh, the performance of rapid earth is compared uh, with existing relevant protocol proposed by freken at all uh, using these matrices as uh, computational complexity is concerned um, we can see uh, the rapid earth it reduces uh, much computational complexity here k represent exponents and l represents the key size the bit operands note the key size for uh, 15 is at least five order of magnitude larger than the field of ecc used in that rapid earth similarly um, uh we uh, for communi communication overhead parameter sizes in bits are considered as id 8 bits random nonces 48 bits as uh, uh, r128 mac 128 uh, rapid earth it completes uh, the communication using two uh, messages m1 which is 60 byte m2 which is 68 bytes so total size Uh, for rapid earth is 128 bytes and for 15 it completes the whole authentication process in three messages so m1 it takes 68 m2 68 m3 32 total 168 bytes in case of uh, 15 similarly verification delay rapid earth requires only two messages to complete authentication um, a puff has extremely high throughput with a no, with a negligible delay this shows that rapid earth can significantly reduce the delay of authentication and is fast enough to be used in real time applications with strict timing delay requirements so um, the verification delay of rapid earth is very low um, we presented a novel protocol rapid earth to extend authentication between a server and an iot device ecc is used to complete mutual authentication by exchange of only two messages we apply puff as hardware security primitives um, the proposed protocol does not store any secret parameter in device memory to restrict physical attacks we can the rapid earth can also facilitate for establishment establishing uh, the session keys we also showed that rapid earth is not only robust against various types of attack attacks including physical attacks but is also efficient enough for simple and low cost iot devices any uh, questions and queries Hello everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Eric Macalla. I'm a master's student from the United States attending Missouri State University, and today I'll be sharing with you some of the progress we've made in our research toward lightweight botnet DDoS detection for IoT access networks using machine learning. First, I'll briefly introduce our problem space. Then I'll survey existing work within the field of IoT security as well as some new developments within the field of deep learning which we believe open exciting new avenues for researchers working within this problem space. I will describe our proposed solution which leverages leverages these new advancements in deep learning and share our experimentation method and results. Finally, I will offer our concluding remarks. IoT security can be understood as a two-fold problem. First, IoT devices have been expanding the size of computer networks. Previously, a home network may only contain a single desktop computer shared by an entire family. However, the addition of laptops, smartphones, and tablets have rapidly increased the number of hosts found within a typical home network. 
Most recently, we've seen the addition of internet-connected things, which can integrate almost anywhere, from household appliances to home security systems. This illustrates how even in the mundane environment of the home access network, the IoT has drastically altered the landscape of computer networks. Second, these IoT devices are often produced with priority going toward minimizing cost to the consumer by manufacturers competing within this new market. They often must be small to seamlessly integrate into their intended environment, and these two factors combined to contribute to the fact that IoT devices are, eft are often far weaker computationally than other network hosts. This has rendered many traditional network security measures, such as asymmetric cryptography, unusable for IoT devices. Botnets are malicious software which seek to infect IoT devices by establishing connections with them, loading instructions into their file systems, and leaving them dormant for some period of time before issuing an attack command. If an attacker can accumulate a large amount of infected IoT devices, they can carry out massively distributed denial-of-service attacks. While DDoS attacks are nearly trivial to attack to detect at the victim due to the enormous volume of attack traffic, they are difficult to mitigate far away from the attacking hosts. Inversely, it can be difficult to detect that a compromised device is participating in a DDoS attack at their access network, but mitigation strategies are best deployed here. The question our research aims to answer is whether accurate botnet detectors can be deployed to IoT access networks. Recently, we have seen a prominence of machine learning approaches in this problem space. Deep learning has received particular attention due to its recent accomplishments in other research domains. In fact, it is currently considered by most to be the state of the art when it comes to machine intelligence. A feature of machine learning that makes it particularly promising in real-time network monitoring is that it often does not require extensive feature engineering, instead extracting its own features from mostly raw input data. However, deep learning carries a high computational cost, which is often too heavy for IoT devices and the typical edge host. This is due to deep learning algorithms working best on specialized hardware, primarily GPUs. Next, I'm going to explore some existing solutions within this problem space and explain what we can learn from these solutions and how we hope to improve on them with this work. Early in our literature review, we discovered a paper describing a, deep, a distributed deep learning model for IoT DDoS detection. The authors utilized the emerging concept of fog computing to bring their model close to IoT access networks, which has the effect of reducing network latency. They tested their solution on the NSL KDD dataset by taking its 41 features and embedding them into an input vector for their neural network. This achieved high accuracy, however, the authors did not explore the viability of their model on FOG hardware to see if it could still function with low latency in this environment. The next method we found was the use of deep autoencoders as anomaly detectors on IoT traffic. The authors of this paper trained their autoencoders on normal benign traffic from one particular IoT device. This approach achieved high accuracy and low latency in detecting flooding attacks during a DDoS attack, and also in detecting port scanning activities used by compromised IoT devices when looking for other devices on the network to infect with the botnet. However, this method would likely experience poor scalability due to the need to train and deploy a different deep autoencoder for each device on the network. Another approach uses PCAP captures as strings and applies textual analysis to them using a bi-directional LSTM. Similar to the last work, it was able to detect the activity of Mirai, a prominent IoT botnet, as it attempted to scan networks, infect devices, and send attack signals to those infected devices, as well as actual DDoS flooding traffic. However, this method would also likely experience poor scalability due to running deep learning analysis on the contents of each packet seen on the network. 
The next paper utilized the emerging concept of software-defined networking to distribute machine learning models across the network edge using the control plane. Specifically, the authors utilized a support vector machine, which is promising for edge hardware because it is much less complex than deep learning algorithms. However, a potential drawback of this approach is that SVMs are typically utilized for less, for less complex tasks than deep learning algorithms due to a decreased accuracy. So this begs the question, if we use an SVM as compared to a deep learning algorithm in this problem space, are we making a trade-off of accuracy for low detection latency? What is the extent of this trade-off, and is it worth it? Finally, we come to our final two papers, both of which concern deep learning, namely the new concept of lightweight deep learning. Specifically, we consider two new models, which claim to be free of the computational burden imposed by other deep learning models, while still retaining their accuracy. First, we have MobileNet, which was designed with mobile devices like smartphones and tablets in mind. It uses 10 times fewer parameters and 20 times fewer resources when compared to Yellow version 2. Second, we consider SqueezeNet, which was designed with embedded systems in mind. The author of this paper uh, based SqueezeNet off of AlexNet, which was considered the state of the art in convolutional neural networks for quite some time. However, this model is extremely deep and contains many layers. SqueezeNet contains 50 times fewer parameters than AlexNet while utilizing 510 times less memory. The authors claim that despite this drastic decrease in complexity, SqueezeNet still achieves high accuracy on several benchmarking tasks. Next, I will share with you our proposed solution, our experimental methods, and our results. This diagram illustrates our proposed system design. Our system runs by running in revolutions of uniform time. That is to say, our system gathers data from an IoT network over a predetermined period of time and analyzes the resulting data from this time interval. This cycle is run continuously to ensure constant surveillance of the network. As you can see, our system consists of two primary modules, the data aggregation module and the network traffic classification model. The data aggregation module is responsible for gathering data from the network's access router. Specifically, it gathers the number of incoming and outgoing packets from each network host. At the end of the current system cycle, these packets are formatted into suitable input for the network traffic classification model, which determines if one of the IoT hosts on the network may be compromised in participating in a DDoS attack. Because DDoS detection happens at the end of each system cycle, it is important to choose a cycle length that is both short enough to allow for early detection of the attack, but long enough to allow the classification model to run to completion before the subsequent cycle's data is ready for analysis, thus preventing bottlenecks which would increase the system's detection latency. The novel contribution of our work sees MobileNet and SqueezeNet serving as the network traffic classification model. However, we ran experiments with support vector machines and LSTMs in this role as well for the sake of comparison. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the novel contribution of our work is the application of MobileNet and SqueezeNet to achieve low latency IoT DDoS detection, which does not sacrifice runtime performance for accuracy. However, both of these models are convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, which are typically designed and used for visual tasks like image classification. To utilize these models to their full extent, we develop a method of visualizing network traffic as graphical heat maps. Tying this concept back to our system design, the data aggregation module will count the number of packets seen coming and going from each host on the network during a period of time and create a heat map which provides a visual representation of these packets that MobileNet and SqueezeNet can understand and draw conclusions from. Each of the rows on the heat map on the right, uh, as indicated by the colored bars seen stacked on top of each other uh, from top to bottom, represents the data gathered for a single host on the network. Each column, which are differentiated by the color differences seen from the left half of the rows as opposed to the right half, 
represent the number of incoming and outgoing packets respectively. Visually cooler colors, like black, purple, or blue, represent lower volumes of traffic, whereas warmer colors, like orange, red, and white, represent higher volumes of traffic. For our experimental analysis of this proposed solution, we utilized the BOT IoT dataset. It contains network flow data from a simulated IoT network, including examples of DDoS traffic carried over the UDP, TCP, and HTTP protocols. We know from an analysis of botnets that are currently active on the internet that all three of these devices, that all three of these protocols are featured prominently in DDoS attacks. So we decided to utilize all three of these classes in our experiments. However, an issue we had to contend with while using this data set is that the network flow information it contains varies in duration from fractions of a second to over half an hour, meaning it would not provide us data in the uniform intervals of time our system is designed to work with. To overcome this issue, we implemented a data pipeline which aggregates the data from the BOT IoT dataset into discrete and uniform windows of time. This dataset contains two operational components, a data transformation module which aggregates the network flows in the BOT IoT dataset into uniform network traffic windows. Then, the dataset factory takes these network traffic windows and transforms them into compatible input for each of our machine learning models, then separates them into testing, training, and cross-validation datasets. This slide covers the specific implementation details of the data transformation module. Algorithm 1 was applied to flows from the BOT IoT dataset to extract network traffic windows. To quickly summarize, summarize we iterate over each flow, determining what percentage of the flow occurred in the current traffic window. We take that percentage of the flow's packets and add them to the current traffic window under the flow's source host. We take the packets that are left over and adjust the old flow's start time to be immediately after the end of the current traffic window so that its remaining information can be included in subsequent frames. We repeat this process until all selected flows have been processed into frames. To determine our traffic window duration, we again turn to the previously mentioned analysis of botnet DDoS activity. From this source, we see that botnet-based DDoS attacks typically occur within one of three time distributions, 6 to 7 minutes, 20 to 40 minutes, and 2 to 3 hours. As a conservative estimate, we selected a traffic window of 20 seconds. This is, uh, this, this guarantees that detection latency will be well below the shortest time distribution for a DDoS attack, while virtually guaranteeing that bot bottlenecks would not occur at the network traffic analysis module. We will see in our results section that our system could run in revolutions far smaller than 20 seconds. However, time constraints prohibited us from running further experiments with smaller time traffic window lengths. Next, we will cover the details of the dataset factory, which takes the traffic windows produced by the data transformation module, formats the data into input compatible with our machine learning models, and breaks that data down into testing and training datasets. As I previously mentioned, MobileNet and SqueezeNet are designed with computer vision applications in mind, so a heat map was created for each network traffic window to provide them with compatible input. For the LSTM and SVM, a one-dimensional array was created for each traffic frame with the packet counts for each host on the network propagating this array. When considering our data, it is worth noting that our method relies on information gathered by the network's access router, which does not have awareness of application-level protocols. Because of this, we simply considered HTTP data from the BOT IoT dataset to be additional TCP data. We split our gathered datasets into 50-50 testing and training datasets. We further broke down the training dataset for the deep learning models into 30% training and 20% cross-validation datasets. Additionally, the training dataset for the deep learning models were downsampled so that the normal traffic class was evenly represented with the attack data class. 
This was done because deep learning models often grow biased towards the class that has the most representation in the training data set, which can have a negative effect on their accuracy. When determining the accuracy of our models, we utilize several different metrics, all of which can be summarized into these four values. Accuracy is simply an indicator of how many inputs the algorithm correctly labeled. Detection rate measured how many attack instances were correctly labeled. False alarm rate measures how many benign instances of how many benign traffic instances were incorrectly labeled as attack traffic instances. The F1 score is the weighted average of precision and recall. The results table on the right gives the average score for each model used across all of our datasets. We can see that the SVM and SqueezeNet performed very similarly, with the SVM having a slightly better accuracy and false alarm rate, but SqueezeNet slightly outdoing it in detection rate and F1 score. MobileNet and the LSTM performed the best, with them being very close to each other in nearly every metric, but MobileNet having a definitively better detection rate. Next, we wanted to determine how suited our approaches were for edge devices. To accomplish this, we ran each model over 4,219 inputs on a Raspberry Pi and computed the average processing time for each input. The SVM, unsurprisingly, was extremely fast, followed by the LSTM, which is also unsurprising as it's a fairly simple deep learning model containing only four network features. SqueezeNet performed the best out of the two lightweight CNNs, with MobileNet being the slowest, with an average processing time of about two seconds. Finally, I'd like to end my presentation today by presenting our concluding remarks. Our approach for using SqueezeNet and MobileNet with graphical heat maps achieved a higher detection accuracy than those seen in our literature review. Our approach should remain scalable as it is a network-based detection mechanism and does not require extensive processing per packet or a new model for each network host. Our slowest detectors still ran in about two seconds on average, which considering the resource constraints of a Raspberry Pi is a promising benchmark. Thank you everyone for your time and attention. Hello, greetings everyone. My name is Nitesh Singh Bharti and I am an assistant professor at Delhi Technical Campus affiliated to the Guru Gobind Singh Indra Plus University in Delhi, India. Today, I am going to present an overview about my paper named as a new intrusion scheme using CatBoost classifier. Let me begin by introducing the phenomena of an intrusion detection system. An intrusion detection system is basically a security system that detects, identifies and tracks the intruders or an invader in a network. In layman terms, it acts like a barrier for intrusions in a system. Also, the term intruder means a person who forcefully enters a system or a network with an intent to steal the data. Moving on, let us see how an IDS actually works. As you can see, the first stage is data pre-processing. In data pre-processing, we perform normalization. Normalization of data is a very crucial step in order to get the best results because the collection of data is from many different sources which have different file formats and hence are needed to be in a single file format for the automation process to be done. It is also done to remove the inconsistencies and remove poorly documented files and complete the database. In the second stage, analysis. 
The data is analyzed to find meaningful relationships and creation of rules. In the third stage, identification, the data sets are evaluated in the network packets to verify the purpose and usages. If any suspicious behavior is suspected, then they are tagged as intruders. In the fourth stage, alarm, the system administrator is notified about the intrusion so that the administrator can perform action accordingly. Moving on, there are certain challenges that an IDS faces. Ensuring an effective deployment in an IT system is very difficult. A lot of professionalism is required from the developer side to make sure that the system is deployed correctly. Many times, industry faces the issue of incorrect installation of the IDS due to budgetary constraints or lack of good IT support. Also, when IDS is uh, spammed with a high quantity of alerts, it, may, it, may, it can become a burden for many IDS systems. Thankfully, Cat Boost can handle a lot of spamming. Sometimes, the alert should not have triggered, but it gets triggered anyway. The IDS system should be smart to detect behavior. The correct implementation of the IDS is required in terms of correct classification of the alert as well. Like I mentioned below, like I mentioned before, the behavior should be detected accurately. Moving on from the issues, I will now introduce the underlying technique of the proposed system. That is the CAT Boost classifier. CAT Boost is an abbreviation of categorical boosting and it is based on gradient boosting. It is an ensemble technique. CAT Boost quickly incorporates many diverse data sources. The implementation of CAT Boost is also easier as well as it does not require a huge amount of data for training. CAT Boost provides a GPU implementation of the learning algorithm and a CPU implementation of a scoring algorithm as well. But why did I select CAT Boost? CAT Boost natively performs the operation of converting a non-numerical data value into a numerical data value in an optimum way that without the usage of any parametric tuning and runs provides and provides satisfactory results in a single run. Well, that is amazing. Before I, before I mentioned that CAT Boost is an ensemble technique, let us understand what that means as well. In an ensemble technique, one can combine different classifiers to perform as a single classifier, which provides better performance as compared to the individual classifiers that were used to build the ensemble classifier. For example, suppose you are making a classification system and begin with the usage of decision trees as the base classifier and you get only 65% accuracy. You must not be satisfied with the results, so you, you decide to move on to another classifier like a support vector machine and you get 70% accuracy. You are still not satisfied with the results. After some operations, after some tinkling, you try to perform the, the mixture of two algorithms to see if this makes any difference and you get around 90% accuracy. This makes the combined method of working with two. Uh, this makes the combined method of working with two algorithms makes more suitable for you. And this technique, which takes two or more technique, and provides one optimum classifier, is better than having two different classifiers without having any better efficiency, inaccuracy, or what. See what happens in the proposed system. In the first stage, we perform collection of data from the various resources. We also need it to be normalized. We need normalization of it as well due to the reasons mentioned that I mentioned before. In the next stage of analysis, the data is analyzed to find meaningful relationships and creation of rules. The method of ensemble based learning is creation of a combination of different models or classifiers 
in order to produce a single model by which it provides a solution with the result better than the individual model's result. CAD boosts are ensemble based learning techniques. This technique of amalgamating different models provides higher efficiency than individual model. The proposed method is based on a boosting technique, which is a part of ensemble machine learning. It is an implementation of data's sequential modeling, which provides an improvement upon the which provides an improvement upon the errors and hence the performance is also improved. Boosting initiates with a weak learner and iteratively the learner is improved over time due to the reduction of errors. An analogy can that be the model is maturing over time. The advantage of boosting is that it provides a strong prediction with low overfitting and its implementation is also easy. The process of boosting is further improved by implementing an extra step, which is to calculate the loss between the predicted and the targeted value. This process is called as gradient boosting. It iterates to the point where the number of errors is relatively zero, and this further improves the model as it is learning on the data produced by its own self as it takes the previous production and modifies it based on the newly generated result. In the next stage, identification. The data sets are evaluated in the network packets to verify the purpose, and those identity intrusions are done by comparison of the, of the threshold. If any suspicious behavior is suspected, then they are tagged as intruders. In the next stage, alarm, we only enter when the identification stage finds any intruders. The system administrator is notified about the intrusion system so that the intrusion in the system so that the administrator can perform actions accordingly. This wraps up the proposed system part of the presentation. Now let's move on to see the results. As seen by the evaluation metrics in the slide, the proposed scheme provides an accuracy of 99.46% on the NSL ADD dataset. Now let me share some of the related work with the different approaches for the same goal. Dhaliwal and others presented an implementation of a network-based ideas with the foundation of XGBoost, another boosting-based machine learning technology, and presented an accuracy of 98.7%. The implementation was performed on the NSL KDD dataset as well. Chen and others also presented an implementation of SGN IDS based on XGBoost. The implementation was performed on TCP dump dataset. The main focus was on the paralysis caused by the DDoS in a network. The DDoS means Distributed Denial of Service. The results provide a higher detection rate with lower false positive. Su and others presented an implementation of a network-based IDS using the XGBoost approach as well, aimed at detecting attacks because an unbalanced dataset. The implementation was performed on the KDD Cup 99 dataset, with the results showing higher accuracy and lower missing rate as compared to Thaliwal. Bhattacharya and others presented an implementation of an IDS based on hybrid principle component analysis aimed at detection of dynamic attacks. Their implementation used the classification process of XGBoost method. This results presented higher accuracy as compared to Chen, ET and others. Moving on to some other related work, Devan and Khare presented an implementation of an IDS by keeping a basis of deep neural network amalgamated with XGBoost. The implementation was performed on the NSL KDD dataset. The results of the implementation turns out to be better in terms of accuracy, precision, recall and F1 score when compared to techniques like logistic regression and SVM. 
Patavaro and Paul Prasett presented an implementation of ideas based on the combination of feature selection with k-means clustering and xgboost classification model that was implemented on the KDD dataset. They only provided a result of 84.41% accuracy and 18.41% false alarm rate. Who and, other, who and others presented an implementation of Adaboost based ideas for network ideas aimed at providing a solution to an especially low false positive rate without changing the computational complexity. The experiment was implemented in the KDD dataset, providing results of 90.4% in detection rate. Moving on from the related work, when the data was compared to the sim sim similar implementation, the comparison clearly shows that the proposed scheme of ca using CAD boost is way ahead than the previously done work, as compared to the 84.41% which was done on k-means clustering by Patavaro and Plur Prasad. In conclusion, I would like to say that CAD boost provides better performance as CAD boost natively performs the operation of converting a non-numerical data value into a numerical data value in an optimum way. And that too without the usage of any parametric tuning and provides satisfactory results in a single run. Also, the accuracy of the proposed system is 99.46% in the paper. Apart from the conclusions based on theoretical answers, Let's see what the major applications of these ideas can be in the practical world. In logistics, where security is the utmost requirement, as the, uh, as the delivery needs to be done on the same exact address on which it was asked. In banking systems, they, ins they, contain, every ins they contain every knowledge about the, every institution, every financial institution of the world. They need to be secured as well. Because if one account can be hacked, then the same process can be repeated to hack another accounts. In terms of government cloud-based servers, because government cloud-based servers contains information about the whole country's population in smart city implementations, as everything is going digital nowadays, it is an utmost requirement to gain more security advantages because if one part of the home can be hacked, then the whole home can be hacked. In medical systems, Medical system contain information about the patient's history. Patient history can be important to some people if the patients are VIPs, like if president, like if the president of USA has any elite, has any ailments, and that is uh, hidden from the world. The medical systems must have contained them, and if they can get hacked, then we can get sensitive information about the president of the United States of America. Thank you. I would like to end my presentation here.
Hello, my name is Ahmed Rashid and today I will be presenting the article IoT based energy monitoring of photovoltaic plants and overview co-authored by Dr. Fadi al Jamal. I will be starting with the introduction followed by a PV, PV power plant systems and the energy monitoring systems with the variables of the monitoring system and their measurements the sensors and other components used for the measurements followed by discussion and recommendations based on the secondary data of literature so as the energy demand increases electric utilities are under high pressure for incremental production as well as finding new and reliable resources for power generation in addition to that current global warming crisis in uh, in this current global warming crisis utilities are more inclined towards finding sustainable power resources carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas concentration in atmosphere is increasing rapidly every year co2 abundance in atmosphere has upsurged to more than 410 ppm in the beginning of the year 2020 from 360 ppm almost two decades ago. Moreover, uh, other GHGs have also increased to 1.6 annual GHG index, making the carbon dioxide equivalent concentration of GHG more than 500 ppm in the atmosphere today. In addition to that, uh, radiative forcing of carbon dioxide has increased almost 60% in last three decades and energy consumption for the year 2019 saw the highs of 627 quad BTUs which is projected to increase up to 910 quad BTUs uh, within the next three decades. This calls the attention towards utilization of clean and environmental friendly energy resources to avail uh, the renewable resources present in local environment for the better future. Uh, in these renewable energy resources, solar is on top of the list, followed by wind, biomass, and etc. So, uh, photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic systems can be categorized based on various factors, which include configuration, connection type, etc. In here, the uh, PV plants are categorized according to their configuration and the first type is grid connected PV systems. As the name suggests these uh, photovoltaic modules or plants are connected to grid comprising of PV panels, power conditioning unit and distribution panel. The functionality of the conditioning unit uh, is to mine the voltage frequency and power impositions of the uh, connected grid. And second in the line is standalone uh, photovoltaic systems, which are also known as direct couple uh, photovoltaic systems. Uh, as, and as the name suggests, they are connected directly to their load. Uh, these systems, both of them, are connect, uh, categorized based on their availability of battery connection. Uh, in the grid connected systems uh, with the battery is the smart grid concept, and without battery is large scale production. And in standalone with batteries is uh, like for instance houses and industries and without battery we have standalone in water pumps etc in addition to these major categories of uh, pv systems based on configuration there are also hybrid systems uh, which include uh, wind photovoltaic and diesel photovoltaic hybrid systems and the uh, photovoltaic based utilities such as solar lamp charge so solar lamps and chargers etc so uh, in here you can see a pv energy monitoring system uh, the necessity of energy monitoring uh, uh, comes from the desire to achieve the desired results in photovoltaic energy as uh, the number of factors affect the optimal outcome of the generation for instance, a partial shadowing of uh, photovoltaic panels cause somewhere around 10 to 20 percent energy loss annually. And there are other production losses due to climatic or geographical conditions. 
So uh, the basic element of uh, photovoltaic monitoring systems include sensors, signal conditioning unit, personal computer, and system control unit. So the first and the foremost element of monitoring systems uh, are the sensors, uh, which are uh, mounted at different uh, points in the energy monitoring system. They measure the variables in real time, which are then filtered, amplified, and processed by a signal conditioning unit. The microcontroller in this unit transmits the conditioned unit to a computer, which instructs the system control unit based on analysis and user commands. So on the right side of the image, you can see all those components starting from the PV panels to the sensors and the processing, <coughs> sorry, the conditioning unit and then the uh, control unit. So uh, there are different variables that needs to be measured for an energy monitoring system and different sensors are used for measuring this system uh, variables. For standalone systems, uh, the output voltage, current, and power of the photovoltaic module is uh, measured for monitoring. Whereas in grid connected systems, the voltage, current, power, and energy outputs are measured from the um, PV systems, and current and power are from and to the utility grid are also measured in addition with grid voltage as well as irradiance and temperature, uh, air, ambient air temperature and PV modules temperature and wind speed, direction, humidity, etc. are also measured you know, for energy monitoring. These are the variables uh, that are measured at different levels of uh, this monitoring systems. As you can see, starting from PV module to inverter and the grid or the consumer uh, load. And the uh, horizontal solar radiation and ambient air temperature are measured on site in addition to uh, PV module temperatures and in plane solar radiation. The DC power is measured as an output of the PV panels, and AC power and the energy is measured between the inverter and the grid or the consumer load. So, uh, measurement of the monitoring variable is a sensitive and crucial part of energy monitoring systems. These variables depict the condition of uh, PV systems and the atmosphere around it, which help maintaining the stability of system and prevent it from any forthcoming faulty conditions. Uh, the parameters of uh, PV modules and the atmospheres, the atmosphere that reflect the major contribution such as current, voltage, temperature, and solar radiations, uh, as you can see in the table, are measured based on working principle. For example, current can be measured by the working principle of Ohm's law, Faraday's law of induction, magnetic field effect, and Faraday effect. Now, these working principles have different methods of measurement uh, for which different sensors are used. For example, shunt resistor, or trace resistance shunting, like different methods are used for different working principles to measure different variables. Similarly, for voltage, there are options of uh, resistive potential divider, potential transformer, etc. And same goes for solar radiation and temperature, that there are different methods based on different working principles to measure different variables. So, uh, the working conditions uh, vary for each and every individual site of uh, PV panels, which results into discrete selection of sensors and other components for particular photovoltaic plants. Depending on the scale of PV plants, shunt or Hall effect sensors are used widely for current measurement. The shunt uh, sensor is low cost, but inaccurate at high current values. Whereas uh, the Hall effect sensor is a high cost, uh, high accuracy sensor. Uh, other sensors are either costlier or have practical constraints, uh, which allow usage in particular conditions only or different particular situations. Voltage measurement is carried out with the help of potential divider, potential transformer and capacitive coupled voltage transformer. Uh, which are used for low, medium, and high voltage measurements, respectively. 
Solar radiation sensors are used based on the working principle required, such as conversion of solar heat into electric signal or measurement of diffuse radiation, etc. And lastly, uh, for the temperature measurement of modules or the air ambient temperature on the site uh, on site of plant. Uh, thermocouples and resistive temperature detectors are examples of widely used sensors. Uh, thermocouples has the tendency of inaccuracy and non-linearity with temperature, uh, whereas resistive temperature detectors uh, has high accuracy and they vary linearly. So based on this uh, literature and secondary data, like you can say, uh, the few recommendations are proposed uh, in the article uh, for different parameter or components of the energy monitoring systems. For example, for the first one is the, are the cables of the energy monitoring system. Uh, protective cable boots can be used to increase the endurance uh, against higher climatic uh, conditions and corrosions uh, since many of the uh, components such as sensors majorly are outdoor mounted so they uh, bear very harsh climatic conditions so in order to prevent uh, the damage uh, different uh, protective cable boots can be used for the cables uh, for the calibration of the equipment end-to-end uh, -end calibration can be carried out to avoid any offset errors in the outdoor environment and temperature uh, for sensors and other components such as uh, PV modules, uh, which are uh, exposed to sunlight throughout the year, uh, they should have a high endurance rating against intense temperature because uh, due to constant exposure to, uh, to sun, light and harsh climate, the uh, er uh, erosion of these uh, components uh, can increase the rate of the erosion can increase so the temperature endurance should be kept high for these sensors and other compo uh, outdoor components the measuring errors uh, can be reduced <coughs> uh, by acquire uh, sorry to uh, by ensuring the precision and omission of uh, measurement errors to acquire true value from sensors and uh, the measuring intervals uh, of these values in which is the data acquisition should be increased the, the frequency of data acquisition should be high so that with a larger data set the recording intervals of the uh, uh, variables will be short and an early forecasting of the failures can be ensured due to a large data set for uh, as, uh, examining and for examination interval, uh, in-person in -person, uh, visual checks should be performed more often uh, as mentioned before that many components, uh, indoor and outdoor components are uh, under very harsh climatic conditions. So in-person uh, checks should be performed more often to ensure accurate operation of the equipment. So I will conclude, uh, s sorry, my bad. An extensive overview of types of photovoltaic plants and their energy monitoring systems, which include the parameters to be measured for efficient monitoring and the sensors used for the measurement of given parameters were detailed in the article. Covering each and every individual sensor is improbable due to complexity and time constraints. Uh, overview can be further expanded to cover the different case studies which have uh, followed mentioned working principles before. And a comparison can be made in the efficiency results of individual sensors. Hopefully the collective information and the recommendation covered in the article can come in handy while developing in efficient photovoltaic energy monitoring system. These are my references and thank you for listening.
I am Mattia Paccamicio and I will be presenting our research work called Light Communication for Controlling Industrial Robots. Uh, I would like to thank those who participated in the research, which are Fadi Alturiman, Diletta Cacciagrano, Leonardo Mostarda and Zai Bulla, from Università di Camerino and near, nearest university in Nicosia. So, uh, our context is uh, in nowadays industry, uh, more specifically industry 4.0 is the, this term we are referring as it today. And we're talking about uh, methods to control and program anthropomorphic robots with their programming consoles, which uh, by nowadays standards are wired. And we want to make them wireless. There have been uh, uh, Wi-Fi powered robot consoles, but they weren't really uh, feasible to work with due to problems with the industrial environments, which features high RF interference from various reasons and poor propagation situations. So we want those robots to be wireless so that uh, the operators can move more freely and they wouldn't be constrained by the wired, both in terms of freedom of, mo freedom of motion and risks attached to it. Our requirements are simple but uh, very strict. We want the robot to be able to move its joints. We want it to be able to be stopped by the typical red uh, mushroom headed button that cuts the power to the motor in a hardware fashion. We want it to be able to deliver this dead man button feature which is a switch that allows the robot to move and we want it to be uh, reliable. Oh, wait, the dead man button allows the robot to move as long as the button is pressed. So. Uh, we need reliability, so both safety and fluidity. And we need it to be real time for safety reasons and because uh, we want it to be comparable to wired applications. So, as for a bit of history of OWC, we have its first application. Uh, for with the Vodafone in the US by the same inventors as the telephone. Then we have the infrared remote invented in Canada in the 1980s. And then in the from the beginning of two th 2000s uh, until nowadays, we have uh, started working with very recent impressive results uh, reached in the United Kingdom. Uh, terrific speeds such as 10 gigabits per second which are equal uh, to those of 5G uh, RF based connections. OWC's working principle is pretty easy. We have an encoder that generates a signal that is fed to an amplifier then the amplifier uh, fed, feeds uh, the voltage to an LED which uh, would heat uh, for the diet, which would generate uh, a replication of that signal, which is then fed to an amplifier and then to a decoder, which would be our uh, network appliance, very roughly speaking. A bit of comparison, very fast. Uh, optical wireless has wide bigger bandwidth. It is usable in RF-free environments. It has a much higher theoretical speed. It's safer regarding hips dropping as a better scalability. It has a short reach. Uh, it needs more APs. It's not very flexible due to the nature of the medium and it's susceptible to every light, especially uh, flickering lights. This is the hardware we have used for, te for testing. We have on the left the access point which features an infrared receiver uh, for the diode the USB dongle on the middle, which features the infrared transmitter, which is the round thing. 
and the visible light photodiode which would uh, receive si the light signal from the LED lamp and on the right the driver which would act as an amplifier and driver to the lamp so that the lamp would know at when, when to send the one and when to send the zero. And now to the testing part, we will discuss the data we have gathered and how we've gathered it. This is our system ar architecture. We have two hosts, uh, one connected via optical wireless and one wired directly to the router. We have measured three parameters in order to assess the quality of the link and th those are packet error rate, uh, throughput and latency. As for packet error rate, uh, we use this parameter to estimate the quality variation of the link based on environmental faction factors. So uh, positions of the dongle, uh, line of sight or non-line of sight, which we will see afterwards what it means and we have performed those tests uh, using that exchanges via UDP counting the frames that were delivered and comparing them to the ones that uh, excuse me to the total of the frames that we have sent double checking the measurement using Wireshark as for throughput uh, we have measured uh, throughput implementing a TCP client server architecture with Hyperfree, which was chosen over older implementation of Hyperf because uh, they might use other protocols like Telnet or Serial, which could uh, pollute the experimental results, so deviating the data from their actual values. So, as for latency, instead we have done pretty much analogous uh, way to measure and calculate previous, the previous parameters, with the exception that in this case uh, we defined a parameter as peaks, which were every delivery that took uh, more than 30 milliseconds uh, in latency so we wanted to know what the uh, higher values of this spectrum were distributed so to know the statistical meaning of this data uh, as for latency we measured the round trip time to estimate the time uh, it, it's taken for 512 bytes to be sent to the router and the related acknowledgement to be received by the console. Uh, this packet size was chosen because it's a sufficient amount of data to control the motion of robots. And this is the tool we use, which is uh, a latency measuring tool that works over TCP. So we have done testing on in two environments this is the uh, in vitro environment so uh, let's say more of laboratory setup and this is the throughput and packet error rate uh, measurement for vertical distance variation where the dongle was kept in li direct line of sight and straight under the lamp so the distance from the horizontal distance from the dongle and the lamp were uh, about zero meter like they were in the direct sight so uh, we can see that the speed and error rate have opposite behaviors and from the result is evident that as the distance increases the throughput decreases and the error rate increases. Uh, at the test poles, the speed dropped by approximately one third of the peak value and the error rate is doubled. This is the same test, but 
instead of varying uh, vertically the distance between the dongle and the access point and the lamp, sorry, we have varied horizontally while keeping the height uh, constant at 2.5 meters. We can see if the speed and error rate have diverging responses, responses and at the extreme values of the test speed dropped by around three times from the peak performances and the error rate got tripled. And now for the non line of sight tests. Uh, in this test uh, the dongle also have varied its position horizontally and vertically but in this case the light wasn't uh, directly facing uh, neither the dongle or the receiver but it was reflected on a surface so you can see the data is very different here uh, as for the vertical test uh, the results show that at the polar values of the experiment speed reduces by approximately one third from the peak value and the error rate almost doubles uh, so, and for the horizontal test, uh, the polar values, uh, the speed almost halves uh, the peak value, and the error rate uh, exceeds the threefold. And now for the latency values. We can see that uh, we have very few uh, peaks percentage. So the, the the, per the probability of getting a peak is very low and the positioning doesn't really matter at this in this matter no uh, sorry doesn't really uh, influence the behavior of the system for the three setups uh, we have a line of sight vertical with a 2.5 uh, distance so we have the typical uh, under the lamp situation with no horizontal distance we have a 1.2 meters uh, horizontally at 2.5 meters uh, vertical distance so at the border of the light cone and we have a 0.2 uh, non line of sight distance from the uh, reflected light source uh, with no uh, vertical distance. Now, uh, as for the warehouse testing environment, uh, we had uh, we doubled the height of the floor so instead of 2.5 meters it was 5 meters and this was a bit of a stretch condition for our hardware but we will see how it performed so we have and this setup we didn't vary the vertical distance we kept it constant to 5 meters and we had two setups uh, one without obstacles whose results you can see them here uh, like uh, comparing to the analogous in vitro experiments the throughput almost halved uh, because of the fact that uh, bigger distances were in play and so uh, this appliance wasn't really fit for this kind of application. So it's worth mentioning that uh, this type of application could need a specific appliance. I mean, you should be using uh, this technology f with a specific appliance, not with this one. Sorry. Then we have the one without transparent uh, barrier put in between the access point, the lamp, and the dongle. The tests uh, were the same as before, so horizontal distance variation from 0 to 2 meters. Here we can see that the transparent barrier makes uh, somewhat of a difference, but it's not very significant 
uh, though it's preferable to not have one. And we have the tests uh, regarding latency and their data, uh, which even in this case uh, aren't really influenced by the presence of an obstacle in this environment and are also very close to the previous ones conducting in the in vitro environment. So uh, regarding our tests uh, we can say that our research question questions were positively answered. This technology has satisfactory performance in terms of latency, reliability and throughput when compared to wired and RF based communications and while our experiments show that it was possible to maneuver robots by using GoWC, they also showed that we would need a special appliance implementation of appliance, sorry, uh, to achieve this goal. Also, the high reliability allows us to implement the most critical functions for this application, which are the development button, which I recall is the switch that allows the robot to move, and the red emergency button. So, uh, we conducted various experiments to observe the suitability and efficiency of OWC-based technology for robot control in industrial environments. Uh, the tests have shown satisfying results overall, uh, even in the industrial environments where the conditions were a bit stretched and even with a transparent obstacles uh, obstacle in a stretched uh, con working condition. So we can say that uh, OWC is a very good candidate for uh, this type of application. As for future research, uh, we want to take measurements uh, regarding light intensity using the available hardware so we can size a new hypothetical system which we can use to experiment with and then we will build a prototype of, out of these uh, estimations that would implement the new, impl new uh, features we have deemed as necessary such as a safety channel dedicated to the uh, red button because uh, as of industry standards it cannot be delivered in the same channel as it as you deliver data and we want to process it separately also for safety uh, safety measures and we also want to implement a pointing system because uh, the distancing is distances in play are not really small and is deemed as necessary because we want to offer the operator the highest degree of movement while maintaining the optical lens quality as close as possible to best conditions. I would also want to like uh, want to thank uh, Miss Covelli from Recanati because they uh, supported us in the experiments with the hardware and uh, structures where we physically experimented and thank you for your attention My name is Ari Dunya Medusain. The co-author of Ari Aldrodman is Egemiko Nakli and Yonei Kirsal Emma. The title of 
her presentation today is design of a navigation system for the blind or the visually impaired. And this is the slide, and this is what I'll be taking you through the abstract, the introduction, the aim, the methodology, the results, and the conclusion. So we start with the abstract. The work here is to give a successful minimal cost system that will help the blind navigate in its, its environment. Here we're going to use the obstacle detection system which is to guide the blind about a suitable pathway. This framework utilizes sensors that will help detect obstacles across a path and it sends back buzzer or audio sound as a reaction which educates the VIP about its position. And the other system entails the environmental imager and the navigation mode. In this case, the VIP that is the blind or the visually impaired will have a caregiver that will direct them across the table parts with the use of a video guidance and with the use of a GPS. Generally, we achieved the accuracy using the system to be around 94.15% to 99.72% and the overall percentage for the obstacle discovery in both indoor and outdoor, it varies from 94.40% to 99.67%. This examination will increase the VIP mobility significantly whenever taken into consideration. And the next slide, this is the introduction. As we know, vision loss is a serious impairment that deprives a human of approximately 80 to 90 percent of their abilities and has a de detrimental effect on professional, social, and personal quality of life. The World Health Organization estimated the number of visually impaired to be about 285 million, majorly above 50 years of age. People with visual or disabilities. They experience several difficulties and several challenges, like going to a place or moving from a place to another place, or entering the bus or the train terminal, or hospitals, education buildings, and shopping mall. Several, several everyday objects that are present in most built environments become a real obstacle for the blind people. Examples of these obstacles are chairs, tables, stairs. This hinders the blind movement and can cause serious accidents to them. The work we present in this paper is based on the use of new technologies since we're in the IoT area to improve visual impairment with a significant effect. The next slide we'll talk about the aim. Yeah, the aim of this work is as follows. An overview about visual impairment navigation system is evaluated. Key plan factors that are required in adding to this framework are put forth. We depict the proposed sensors and the global positioning system, that's the GPS, for both outdoor and indoor navigation respectively. We outline the accuracy and impact of the proposed framework. Last week, lastly, we portray design issues and difficulties. So we we'll dive into the methodology now. This, sec this section involves the behavior, the structure, and more perspective of the framework. The description is formal and is easy to depict. The, enge the engineering of the system comprises of components of the system and the development of the system that will work hand in hand while using the general framework. The outline of this is given in the figure below. So we'll take a look at the figure. Here we can see the main system. The system is divided into two, the obstacle detectors and the environmental imager and the navigation system. The obstacle detection comprises of three parts, user control, sensor control, and the output. While the environmental image consists of just the VIP and the caregiver terminal. 
Here we can see the system is divided mainly into two parts, the obstacle detection and the environmental imager and navigation system. The obstacle detection will be able to detect obstacle, detect the distance between users and obstacle, will be able to provide a good pathway to the user, will be able to, to help the user interact with the surroundings. So while the environmental image and navigation system, users will be able to speak dial the customer care. The user will give the customer care his location so the customer care can guide the user to appropriate paths. Customer care will navigate the user through satellite view and appropriate platform. Path planning. User will also have a camera so customer care can see in real time and guide the VIP. So this is the depiction of the obstacle detection. We can see here the main system comprises of the sensor. The sensor sends a sound wave to the obstacle to detect the obstacle. And this is the walking stick. And you can see the sensor is on the walking stick from so the sound wave to the obstacle to detect the obstacle. And here is the depiction of the environmental image and the navigation system. So this is the VIP and this is the caregiver. So they share video, GPS and audio in real time. And the caregiver will be able to direct the VIP through appropriate path planning. And the methodology, yeah, this is the tools used in building the overall system. You can see the Arduino Uno, ultrasonic sensor, microphone sound sensor, camera, cell phone buzzer, breadboard, and so on. And here is the block diagram of the obstacle detection system. So the computational environment, the experiment is carried out. The experiment carried out in this paper were implemented physically and using simulation software like Proteus, Arduino interface, and Android Studio. These are open source and is an OP standard programming condition. It takes a shot at multiple platforms like Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. Testing and the simulation operation was evaluated on a PC with 2.6 GHz and a 6 and a 8 GB RAM. Whereas the physical experiment was carried out in both outdoor and indoor condition. So here are the experimental process. Here this is an algorithm depicting the obstacle detection model. You can see from the first we start, we initialize the port. The microcontroller reads the US, that is the ultrasonic sensor. And if the, if the distance is above 200, it doesn't detect. But if it's below, it detects. So this is generally, generally the algorithm it takes to detect the obstacle. And this is the flowchart of the obstacle detection summarized. The transmitter and the receiving end, microcontroller initialization, it receives data from the sensor, it converts it to digital, fits into the microcontroller, converts from digital to analog. And this is sent to the alarming unit, the alarm triggers, and that's the end of the process. While here, is for the environmental image and the navigation system. So the first step is the VIP. The VIP starts a phone guidance section, then gets voice instruction from the remote caregiver to navigate by the click of a button on the application installed on this phone. The second step, the VIP initiates a live stream and the location of the VIP will be sent to the caregiver. The VIP follows the guidance in which the caregiver navigates with adequate parts planning. And lastly, the user terminate the call. So also the testing stage for the caregiver, for the caregiver, 
Firstly, the caregiver receives the phone call from the VIP. Then the second step, the caregiver directs or finds the appropriate path plan for the VIP. And third, the, get, the caregiver gets an indication that the VIP terminates the call and the caregiver acknowledges the termination. So as you know, the VIP is the visually impaired person. And this is the depiction of the environmental image. You can see the VIP, the server, the caregiver, attempts call, server, caregiver accepts. So generally, this is the depiction of the whole process. And the next slide is the results. Yeah, every strategy of the experimental condition is clarified, including the calculation and programming setup. All experiments are efficiently performed. The after effect of every one of the experiments are recorded, shown, and are talked about. From the ex estimated part of the system, the usefulness and affectability of the sensors are of extra extraordinary significance and are examined. To confirm this, deliberate outcomes are constructed. Various movement styles of working were also considered. This implement is additionally modeled and tested, particularly in the part of the human body and appropriateness of alert type. Results from both limited component examination and trial works have demonstrated that the sensors are fit for distinguishing different kinds of endurance materials surface color and size of impairment. In this way, the result shows the accuracy and effectiveness of the system. You can see the first experiment carried out. This is the obstacle detection system sensibility toward different angles and distance. This is the measured corresponding angles is measured in CM. And this is the distance CM. So 30 CM distance, 120 angle, you can see the accuracy here. You can see how it's measured. Yeah, this is the result of the measurement. And the next one, sensor accuracy and average accuracy toward obstacle surface color. So yeah, this is the color of all surfaces. This is the initial distance of the experiment. We tested it in both indoors and outdoors. And the accuracy average, the average of the accuracy of both indoors and outdoors are summed up here. You can see in black obstacles, you can see it holds the highest accuracy in indoor. This is 92%. So we summed up the accuracy average here. And you can see the best so far is on black surfaces with the highest peak of 99.38. Then the next one, you can see sensor accuracy and average accuracy towards obstacle shapes. We can see rectangular, circle, and cylindrical obstacles. For the rectangle, we tried it in outdoor, indoor, and the accuracy of both of them for indoor and outdoor, and the average accuracy for all of them is depicted here. And you can see the best so far is the cylindrical shape with the accuracy of 99.71 right here. So lastly, the conclusion. Here, we presented and depicted a safe system for the mobility of the VIP. One of the focal points of the system is it makes the user mindful about hindrances of rights 
left and front side adequately. We are utilizing the benefit of the walking stick and recognition by sensor investigation. The system can the system gives a precision in recognizing hindrance of right, left, and front, with comfort for the user, assuring protection from both head and ground level. It is also low in cost and an exceptionally low power utilization. The quantitative assessment to explore the dominion given by the VIP includes route planning, where put forth. The accuracy accomplished for the system varies from 94.15% to 99.72%. The percentage rate of the snag discovery for either indoor or outside varies from 95.40% to 99.67%. This assessment will increase the VIP versatility essentially at whatever point being thought of. And future explorations. We can see with the utilization of AI, it might increase the accuracy and the precision more appropriately. Also, utilizing a neurofusy control application calculation into programming the microcontroller is strongly recommended. Joining the framework with RFID is also recommended. Battery observation is also recommended. Finally, new gadgets for detecting advances coordinated chips can be introduced into the system. This paper is without a doubt a groundbreaking experience that empowers ASIM and far-reaching range related to designing abilities and skills. Thank you. We will talk about the CSG applications and standards, and we will give an overview about the CSG enabling technologies, its applications, and its applications, and the standardization. As we know, it's in the early stage to talk about the CSG, and as we know, 5G has already standardized in 2019 and its deployment is started at the late of 2019 but uh, it is unfortunate that 5G cannot fulfill the requirement the requirements of emerging new application is real time and interactive service internet of everything application is like augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, which requires uh, convergence of communication, sensing, control, and computing functionalities. Uh, also, new services such as holographic communication, high precision manufacturing, sustainable development, enhanced energy efficiency, to fulfill this challenge, the research of CG starts, and we are what we are expecting is we, it's a forecast that CG will start its conversation in 10 years in 2030, and it will give or it will provide ultra speed, great capacity, and ultra low latency for supporting the possibility of new applications such as telesurgery, intelligence disaster protection, and serial virtual reality. CSG is expected to advance the wireless technologies we are familiar with today and achieve considerable enhanced system performance. 
As you all know, the wireless that traffic is uh, increasing rapidly, and current cellular network, even the 5G, can it cannot completely match uh, the quick rise in technical uh, requirements of these applications. So that's why it's needed to make a research on 6G. Uh, if we Okay, this is the introduction. Uh, in this slide, we are talking about a brief history about mobile development or evaluation of mobile communications starting from 1G up to 6G. If we start about the first generation, If we start about the first generation of mobile communication, it was only offering voice calling and it was introduced in 1980 and it designed for voice service. It relies on uh, analog signals to transmit information and has no established wireless standards. This leads to many disadvantage about uh, including hand, hand over uh, and offers and lack of security. Then the second network development or the second G, it's based on digital communication instead of analog, such as uh, time division multiple act. It was using digital modulation techniques such as, such as time division multiple access and code division multiple access, which can support both. Uh, voice and short message service and the most in sport importantly the most important and widely used mobile communication was the GSM when we are talking about in second generation the third generation 3G uh, it started in 2009 and in 2000 it was provided a uh, high speed data transmission and access to the internet which means at least it can provide 2 megabits per second however this speed can learn about the advanced service that are not possible in the 1G and 2G network including web browsing, TV, streaming and video service then the 4G or long term evaluation network were introduced in 2009 providing uh, the third rate of up to uh, 1 gigabytes on the downlink and about 500 megabytes per second on the uplink this network is um, provide a better, better, uh, better spectrum efficient and reduce latency which means they can they can meet the requirement of advanced application is such as digital for video broadcasting, DVB, high definition television content, all of that stuff. On the 5G, we can look for uh, 5G can provide a faster speed, more convenient system, and more secure adjector. The main advantage of 5G network is to facilitate the connection of an increasing number of devices and provide high quality services for all devices simultaneously. Moreover, the support device will, need, will not be limited to smartphones, other devices like IoT equipment can also connect to the network. Uh, our expectation of CSG is to provide high capacity comparing on and low latency compared to the 5G
in terms of capacity uh, 6G will be able to flexible and efficient connect about trillion, trillion level objects rather than the current billion level mobile device the capacity of 6G will uh, be 10 to 1 times 1000 higher than that of 5G system and networks 5G will technology will allow for a, a latent time of one millisecond. However, this is too long for industrial IoT and some other latent sensitive applications. For example, uh, a minimum latent time is essential for decreasing collision or collision rates and improving the safety in autonomous vehicles. For this purpose, 6G aim for giving us less than one millisecond latency. In this slide, we talk about the enabling technologies of CSG. The potential key technical features of CSG will include terahertz communication, is feasible light communication, very large scale antenna, a device general coding will be crucial for achieving the peak rate of 10 terabytes per second and extreme latency. A defense general coding and modulation on space high ground holographic radio and large internet service are promising in significant improving the energy efficiency and reducing the hardware cost of the network uh, we will talk about some of these enabling technologies separately let's talk here the terahertz communicate the terahertz and it's one of the enabling technologies of uh, 6G. We know, like, the, since the rise of mobile networks in the 1980s, we have witnessed uh, tremendous expansion of spectrum resources in every gen new generation due to the endless pursuit for that rate. One of the main targets of 6G is to provide terabytes per second and a great bit rate, and it's inevitable. To operate at high frequency for available spectrum and bandwidth, terahertz and visible light are two attractive candidate spectrum. Uh, the terahertz frequency band ranges from 0 0.1 to 10 terahertz, which is the last band of the radio spectrum, and generally considered as terahertz gap. The terahertz band is infinite to provide with up to terabytes per second that speed to satisfy the extremely high throughput, low latency, and can be the new application scenario for 6G, which may not be possible in millimeter wave band, uh, where the system bandwidth can really exceed 1 gigahertz. Here is another uh, enabling, one of the enabling technologies of CSG. Uh, it's feasible light communication. The feasible light communication uh, is a promising approach. It's a promising approach uh, that could use could use it to solve uh, the growing demand for wireless connectivity. VLC has been studied for a number of years and has been already deployed in many areas such as indoors, uh, indoor positioning systems and the figular ad hoc networks. And VLC for has many VLC has many attractive advantages of a classical radio communication. Uh, visible light spectrum provides ultra high bandwidth with and and spectrum uh, it's free and unlicensed second vis uh, also visible light transmission medium cannot be rate or big of duration this means that the transmission of a network information is is connected to one building and receivers outside the building are incapable of receiving the signals which officially guarantees the information transmission security and reduces the intercell interface that is very serious in high frequency or RF communications.
orbital angular momentum uh, it's another enabling technology the key advantage of OEM uh, the electromagnetic wave characteristic is associated with beam velocity beam velocity and the phase specificity we have an infinite number of on state that improves transmission capability and theoretical spectral efficiency of a wide range of journalists OM has opened up a new layer of electromagnetic wave multiplexing which will provide a new way to significantly increase a spectrum efficiency and expect to be introduced for future CSG wireless communications. Holographic um, communication is one of the kilometers of the CSG period is a three-dimensional technology that tries to manipulate beam light rays to target and then use a recording instrument to capture the resulting interfer interference button. Holographic communication will be a major uh, breakthrough for healthcare and CG is capable of providing this service. 6G holographic uh, communication will help connect people in case of emergence. In this section, we talk about the 6G applications. As you know, every new era of network technology, it brings new and different applications. Although some applications from beneficial network generation will still be applied to 6G. The next, the next following slide, we will talk about some application, some CSG applications. Let's start by this one, the robotic is an autonomous system. The connected robotic is an autonomous system is one of the applications of CSG. A variety of automotive technology experts are currently studying field and wired cars. The CSG system are used for the attachment of robots and the implementation of autonomous system the UF drone delivery system is an example of this kind of system and automated 6G wireless communication field will radically change our everyday lifestyle uh, the autonomous system should contain uh, a multi-dimensional network moreover the, the system should embed on not all intelligence across the whole network but also the logic of uh, AI into the network structure that will enable all internal components components to be uh, to be automatically uh, controlled and connected via AI. Another uh, another exciting application of CG will include the multisensor XR applications. This, uh, the high bandwidth and low latency of uh, CSG network uh, have already improved the virtual and augmented reality experience. However, there are still there are still uh, many problems in the application of embedding VR, uh, virtual reality in 5G networks which need to be solved uh, in the 6G network. For example, cloud virtual reality or augmented services can already bring some immersive experience to the users, but the latency is a significant problem, and the resulting uh, ambiguity, ambiguity leads to more problems. Deploying virtual reality through cloud service makes it more portable and also easier to access but uh, with 5G pine with this image needed to be compressed so transmitting enormous uh, quantities of lossless image or video in real time will need uh, to wait for the 6G network and in the CSG networks, the immersive in the CSG network, the immersive of 
virtual reality and augmented right will be far improved multiple sensors will be used to collect uh, sensory data and provide feedback to the user and if we go further and talk uh, if you go to conclusion here we have talked this one the one of the application of CSG uh, let's talk the healthcare sector how CSG will affect the healthcare it's expected that the CSG communication technology will revolutionize the healthcare completely and the healthcare will fully depend on communication technology we will evidence the paradigm shift in healthcare due to the um, advent of communication technology current state of art health system is unable to to provide to the surgery due to the communication issue and what we are expecting the CSG is to solve that problem and give uh, a low latency network that will make possible to do telesurgery network telesurgery and also moreover Ambala service is to be replaced and wearable device needed to be redefined the hospital is to be required to reach to reach uh, to make any um, structure the health service should provide a real time health monitoring and elder service needed to be redefined uh, we know that many times the patient has traveled to many doctors for a correct diagnosis or their treatment is unavailable in the hospital they are the patient may have to may have to travel to different state or to different countries in such case it become it becomes an economical and physical burden for the patient also traveling in bad health is very uh, stressful for the patient uh, but however, uh, using holographic communication, the doctors can diagnose remotely. The patient can only visit the hospital for treatment. And holographic communication will also help the expert doctors provide service in rural areas while staying in cities or towns. And that's great. Uh, that's great. Here we are talking about the artificial intelligence in 6G. Uh, in 6G, we're depending on our use artificial intelligence in a lot of sectors. AI will be fully supported in 6G for automation. It will be involved in the handover, network selection, and resource allocation. Uh, improving the performance, especially in delay sensitive applications. AI and machine learning are the most important technologies. In 6G, also uh, machine learning will give uh, the 6G to, or it will be used for prediction. We come the last slide and or the conclusion. Uh, we can say that CSG is expected to will uh, it's it, it start its commercialization in ten years, and CSG mobile lender is expected to provide ultra fast speed, higher capacity, and ultra low latency to support the potential of, of for new applications such as telemedicine, hub tickets flying fields, intelligence disaster prediction, serial for reality, uh, 6G also is expected to advance the wireless technology that we are familiar with today and to achieve significant enhanced system performance. We can conclude 6G will give high that rate and high that and, and high capacity, extreme coverage from its base to undersea or underwater networks, low latency, and 
low energy and massive connectivity worldwide massive connectivity that's it thanks Good evening everybody so by now we are reaching to the end of our gathering phones iot 2020 i wish you find the session so far fruitful and insightful and it was up to your expectations to wrap up this conference let me conclude with the following few words today's meeting was such a good first step in examining the issues surrounding the new development of forthcoming networks and sustainability in the iot era we have a lot of work remaining in order to realize these networks and systems in practice but based on the good discussion we had and the potential attempts we have seen i trust funes iot 2021 will bring much more in its occurrence next year as you know the next step for each researcher now in this interesting area is to start preparing for our next gathering in 2021. I am also so glad to announce that the best paper award goes this year to three top quality articles as follows. The first one, share a design pattern for the composition of IoT dynamic services for the corresponding author Rosario Coleman. The second one, a new intrusion detection scheme using CAT POST classifier for the corresponding author Naitish Senf Pehati. And the third one, Rapid Auth, fast authentication for sustainable IoT for the corresponding author Shehzad Ashraf Khudari. Congratulations for those authors and for their great and hard work. Moreover, all the accepted and presented papers at FUNES this year will be submitted for publishing via Springer to be made available through the Springer Link Digital Library. The conference proceeding as well will be also submitted for inclusion in leading indexing services including the EAI, Combedix, ISI Web of Science, Scobus, Crossref, Google Scholar, DBLB, and much more. Additionally, Selected papers will be considered to be included in the Springer's Mobile Networks and Application Monet Journal with impact factor 2.6. And of course, all accepted authors are eligible to submit and extend their accepted papers in a fast track of EAI endorsed transactions on Internet of Things and the EAI Springer book series. Please drop me an email if you are interested. Finally, I would like to thank again this event organizers and sponsors, the keynote speaker and attendees for their kind help and support. I would like to thank the staff and students in Near East University especially who have supported this distinguished event and helped in making it a success. I appreciate everyone's participation today and look forward to our next meeting in 2021. Until that time, please stay safe and healthy. Most sincerely, Fadi al -Turjman. Thank you.